This is The Express with Gary Allen, your 360-degree view of the world. Now, here's your host, Gary Allen. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Express, and thank you for taking a few minutes out of your day to join us for this edition of The Express. Uh, I know tonight we have the National League uh, playoff series going on, so I'm sure a lot of people are watching that, but I want to thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your day to join us. We've got a very, very good show uh, tonight. We have uh, actor, comedian, director, producer, all-around great guy and friend, Will Schreiner. Will's uh, accolades and his accomplishments are numerous. He has directed many episodes of Frasier, Becker, Everybody Loves Raymond, Gilmore Girls. He's appeared over 50 times on uh, The Jay Leno Show, The Tonight Show, David Letterman, Johnny Carson, he also has a working relationship with Bill Gates, and he was in. He co-starred in the movie Peggy Sue Got Married in 1986, where he co-starred with Joan Allen and worked with the great director Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, Will's father was the great Herb Schreiner, and his brother Ken. For those of you that are fans of General Hospital, he plays Scotty Baldwin on there forever in the day. Before we get to Will, and I know he's there, don't forget you can join me on Facebook at Gary Allen. You can also get me on Twitter at G, capital G, the small a, the express, and also meetgaryallen.com on Know Me. And, uh, you know, we, I would appreciate all you who join in and, and let me know what you think of the show. And it's always a pleasure to be with you. And hello to Randy out there because I know Randy is having a really great time joining us every week. And, uh, Will, I know you're there. So, uh, and Randy, yes, I say hi. Will, how are you tonight? Gary, I'm good. How are you? Oh, I can't complain. I uh, I could, but then again, who would care? You know what I mean? That's I'm right. Going... Well, I'll put me down for the first one. <laughs> uh, that takes me back to our days when we used to play softball at Fairfax High School there in Los Angeles, California. Uh, oh, that's a long time ago, back when my knees were good. Yes, and I could actually uh, chase after a baseball. Now, if I had to chase after some of those balls that some of those guys actually hit, I would be uh, out of breath after about three or four steps. But we used to have fun on Saturdays and Sundays doing that. The only negative to Will, by the way, is he's a Florida Gator and I'm a Kane. So that's the only negative. Oh, you went to the University of Montana. Well, a lot of guys go to U U of M. Is that a four-year school or is that a two-year school? Oh, no, that, that's a four-year school. Uh, uh, oh, it you is. Know, oh, okay. Well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. You know, it's 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 a four year institution, just like the Gators. You know, well, I was only at two years. So I was a Gator for two years, and I was a Bruin for three years. So, and you uh, you know, and you know, that's another thing that we parallel each other on. I went to school after I knew you. I went back to school at UCLA and studied advertising. Oh, well, there you go. Well, you know who gave me the advice on that was Bud Friedman. Uh huh. But Bud Friedman's still still alive and kicking. He had a stroke, but he's still sharp. A friend of mine saw him the other day and. Said he's doing good. I'll tell you what. Bud's got to be in his late 80s. Bud was so instrumental in helping me find my place in a sense because he always said to me, he said, you know, you ask interesting questions of people. You should be a talk show host. And it took me a long time to finally get around back to that. But, you know, Bud used to hold uh, town meetings there like Leno used to at the front of, uh, of the improv. And we always knew when Leno was coming down the street, I was always tell people this story that you'd hear him blocks and blocks away on that motorcycle of his that he had at the oh. time. And you remember yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. Jay and I used to ride our motorcycles around to town together. We'd ride them up on the Rock House and the Tvanga. Me, him, Arsenio, and Rick Overton were the uh, comedy bike gang of the day. But Jay had a lot of bikes. I spent a lot of time with Jay. As a matter of fact, a buddy of mine, I, mm-hmm. I gave Jay, my dad brought a World War II parrot, it was called a... Um, it was a little papoose, and it was a little thing they used to throw out of the airplane with a parachute, and the, and the guys would land, and they could ride around. Mm-hmm. And I had this thing sitting in my warehouse forever, and I didn't know what to do with it. And I thought, you know, I'd donate it to somebody. And then I said, Jay would love it. I gave it to Jay because I love it. I'll restore it, and if you ever want it back, you can have it back. So it's in his collection now. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I'm always watching him on the, uh, you know, on the um, on the Jay Leno's garage. I was watching that last night, you know. When is that on? Because I was uh, I wanted to, I was going to talk to him about uh, coming on as a guest. Uh, yeah, I is that, he, on, is that once a week? Yeah, I think it's on once a week. It's on Monday nights. Uh, it's opposite Monday night football. But to tell you the oh. truth, the way those games have been going, I'd much rather watch Jay's Garage because I've known Jay probably about as long as you have. I mean, we we both started out there in Los Angeles, and 
Uh, it's a great show. I mean, it really is. You look at some of the old antique cars. He gets in and he explains them. He talks about them. Oh, and and well, you can love, that's his passion. You should see. I was in his warehouse when I went over yeah. to drop off my motorcycle. I mean, that warehouse is now three warehouses full of cars. Well, I, I, I've make, been. You, you, yeah, go ahead. You, you've. I, I've been in the garage. I've been in the warehouse, and it's really an airplane hangar, isn't it? From one of the uh, commercial airlines that he bought it from. Well, yeah, it's up. It borders up on one five right at Burbank Airport. So he has he bought one of they were hangers, and then they have a fence now. And uh, he has three or four buildings all adjacent to each other, where he's got all these. He's got one building is just Duesenbergs, and one is just motorcycles, and one is you know he's real, and he's got a lot of. I gave him a great old poster for my dad started the international motor sports show in in new york in 51 yeah so i had a couple of posters and i thought well who's gonna you know jay had him he, as soon as i gave him he goes oh i'm having frame tomorrow you know so he's the he's, guy that really loves that has a passion for all that stuff yeah he my love is for airplanes the way his love is for uh for uh, uh cars but unfortunately i don't have the kind of dough that he does to afford the airplanes that he has yeah yeah that's true well he uh you know he i tried to get him to learn to fly but fly in my whole life and i tried to yeah. get him in. i said well jay why don't you learn to fly i think you'd like it i think you'd love the old airplanes the mustangs and all that stuff and yeah he he, he i mean he when he works he, uh, a, a buddy of mine just came back from boston with him on a on a on a gulp g4 Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, Jay, that's how he gets around. You know, he jumps on these planes and goes and does a gig. He flew to Boston in the morning, did a gig, and then flew home that night and got up the next morning to go to San Diego. So here's a guy that doesn't stop, you know. Yeah, he's the hardest working guy in the business. He would do that in Vegas. He would come in in late afternoon, around four or five o'clock, have something to eat at the hotel at the Mirage, go do a show, and then fly home that night and then repeat the same cycle the next day when he would uh, work the weekends in, at the Mirage in Las Vegas. Right. Well, there's a lot of comedians that want to sleep in their own bed. I mean, Foxworthy had a jet. Howie Mandel mm-hmm. has a jet in his deal. You know, Bill Maher, you know, Dennis Miller, these guys, they fly in, they do their show, and they fly home the same night. I mean, it's it's nice if, you, if you're making that kind of dough yeah. that you can put that in your contract. You know, you and I, we don't, you know, I get <laughs> cab fare. <laughs> yeah. You remember the days when we used to get cab fare uh, doing, uh, when we first started out, we used to think, man, that's, Man, we're we're in. We're getting paid to be comics. I mean, that's uh, you know that that's well, good stuff. I started before we got paid. I got, at the comedy store. I was there before the strike, and then the strike came along, and we started getting like fifteen or twenty dollars a, a set. You know, but yeah. I, when we first start, when I first started out, nobody got paid. Yeah, I started in seventy seven at the comedy store with Letterman and Richard Lewis and Gallagher and all these, and nobody got paid in those days. And then we had a big strike in like the summer of seventy seven. They're making a. Jim Carrey's making a Showtime series about that, based on that book, uh, I'm Dying Up Here, by mm-hmm. uh, the Vanity Fair writer. And, uh, yeah, they're going to make a series out of that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a period thing. So it'll be interesting. It'll, be, it'll bring back memories for all of us that came up in those years. Yeah, and those, it really was, as compared to what's going on today, which we're going to get to later on in the program. But I want to kind of step back a little bit. You grew up in a show business family. Your father, Herb, was a well-known comedian as well as a, ta- uh, a game show host. What was it like growing up in a household? Uh, as I mentioned, you have a, a brother, Ken, who is, uh, what is he? He's a little bit older than you, I believe, correct? He, he's eight minutes older than I am. <laughs> the, happiest, the happiest eight minutes of his life. <laughs> and then you also have a sister, I believe, as well. I do have a sister, Indy, who was named after Indiana. My dad was from Indiana. He was a folksy. Mm-hmm. He got started in radio, and then he was on TV from 1949 to about 58, uh, doing a two for the money. It was a game show he did with the dancing cigarette packs. And then he did, it was kind of like You Bet Your Life, where people would ask questions, and he, a panel show. And then he did a variety show, and then he got out of television and worked live. He did concerts and fairs. He was a, a mm-hmm. virtuoso harmonica player as well, so he would... Uh, you know, do uh, he would he would do a show with a pops orchestra, and he would you know tell his stories, and so I grew up watching him work and going around, and we had a right. at the time we had a little Gibbon ape that we were my dad had brought back had bought when he was like three or five weeks old, and so he'd been raised as my uh, other brother, my hairier other brother who didn't talk <laughs> back. So I would wrangle him on shows. We'd go, and I remember the monkey and I would stand in the wings because my dad would have the monkey and come out in his act, you know, talk about you know his kids and how he's got a you know a new new child yeah. and uh, the monkey and i would stand in the wings and watch him work and you know listen to the laughs and you know and then you know and and i looked at the monkey and the monkey looked at me and but we both thought hey this is a pretty cool gig so yeah. i got into show business the monkey now is retired but i'm still working 
<laughs> I love that. Well, you and I basically have we have a lot of parallels in our lives. I grew up with a show business person in my family. The, uh, the late Tubby Boots was my uncle who was on Miami oh, really? Beach for forever and a day. So I got to travel with him. It's sort of like uh, uh, Rick, Richie, Ricky Martin, who was on the show not long ago, Dean Martin's son. And we all we well, I talked about I went, to, I went to grade school with Ricky Martin. Yeah. <laughs> I know Ricky. I used to go to his house when Dean was, you know, Dean. We'd go to his house in the '60s, and Ricky's. Ricky was my buddy. I haven't talked to him in a long time, but we would ride scooters around, and and we'd go in, and the old man would be up there with Frank and and Sammy and all these yeah. guys, and we were we were into slot car racing at the time. Right. And we'd go in, and we go hey, and, and we go hey, let's see, hit your dad. I'll see you get some money to go slot car racing. And he'd go in there, and he's dad. We're thinking about slot car racing. He, and Dean would peel off a twenty to everybody. You know, you yeah. could slot car race for about a week on 20 bucks. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I remember yeah. one time Tubby called up my mother and said, hey, I'm going down to the Fountain Blue and I'm going to meet some friends for lunch because Tubby knew everybody. And and I, uh, so and he said, I want to take Gary with me. So we went down to the Fountain Blue Hotel and we walk in and who's sitting there at a table having lunch and we're going to have lunch with him. But Frank, Sammy and Dean. Uh, and that, yeah. that was the first time I really and that's when I got hooked. Although that wasn't the direction I wanted to go in my life. I wanted to be like, like my dad, an airline pilot. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the war kind of uh, took that out of me. By the way, Ricky has a lot in common not only with you and I, but he's also learning how to fly now. He just bought himself a helicopter, and he's learning how to fly helicopters up in his ranch in Utah. Wow, that's amazing because his brother, you know, died in a plane crash. Yeah, yeah. Dino. Uh, Dino, Desi, and Billy, and Dino was flying for the uh, – California Air, Air National Guard flew into the side of a mountain. It was kind of tragic. And Dean that never killed. recovered from that. Yeah, that well, I used to see Dean at La Familia, which was a restaurant on, on Cannon or Crescent there. And yeah. Dean just seemed like, you know, it just, it just like took, it just took his whole mm -hmm. spirit away. It's always a it, sad, sad thing. Yeah, Ricky, Ricky often says that too. Dina will say the very same thing because I knew Dina when I lived in Las Vegas. And Dina well, will Dina say the flies. same. Dina's the pilot. She, yeah, she, she, had, she had a three ten or something for a while. Yeah, yeah. We, we well, all... it's funny because we're you know we all I don't know I I grew up I, my dad had a PBY when I was a kid which is an old oh. surplus. Uh, he had a Catalina they bought war surplus and we used to fly to the Bahamas in it and sleep on it. It yeah. was like a flying RV. It was a big you know it was a rescue plane. They used them in a war right. to rescue the down pilots and we would fly around it. So I sat on a pilot's, you know, lap and got to fly a plane when I was about seven years old. Right. And the minute I got some money at 20, I got my license and I've been flying ever since. Well, it's funny growing up with your dad as an airline captain and his two brothers. It's funny that when I went into the Air Force, the first thing they looked at was they said, wait, you're 18 and a half years old. You got a pilot's license, multi-engine rating, instrument rating. How do you get this? And I said, well, I kind of grew up in the airline industry. Next thing I know, I'm flying egg beaters in Vietnam. So, I mean, it's it's. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, so it's Flying it's Skymaster Sky over there. No, 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 no. My buddy uh, John Harper, who uh, owns the WMEL, was a bird dog pilot over there. That's how he and I met. But uh, no, um, he he. I flew uh, Hueys. Oh, you oh you're a helicopter guy. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I flew an you know, But uh, I want to be a unique experience. Somebody I knew a guy that shot our some film in our movie, uh, <laughs> and he said. Uh, we were flying and, and we were doing aerials with a with a with a with a uh, picture vision sky you know a rig on our on a helicopter and right. we were getting pretty you know tight into these areas and he, and I said is this scary he goes no it's, it doesn't scare me I, I used to fly when they were shooting at you yes yes <laughs> yeah. as long as they're not shooting back at you you're fine well yeah. what was it like with your dad as far as obviously being behind the scenes watching your dad on stage was that when you got the bug to get into this business and and did you know that you wanted to be a comic or an actor or a director i mean or did you just kind of leave the door open let's see where it takes me uh you know i i was funny in school you know i went to catholic school and if i could make my friends laugh where a nun would come over and hit them it was sort of rewarding. <laughs> so, yes uh, uh you know i that's where i first realized that a sense of humor was a great tool you know it was it was, you know, it was, it was good with, you know, with girls. It was good. And, and I used to like, you know, I'd work go on the road with my dad. My dad bought Elvis Presley's old motor home. Mm. And he would tour around in the summer going and doing dates, doing his, his one-nighters. And, uh, you know, I would wrangle the monkey and I would go, you know, watch him work for like an hour. And then he had the rest, the whole rest of the time off. So it always was like, hey, that's a nice job. And when I was, I, I had a job at 15, you know, being a bus boy and being a re cleaning out rental boats. And, and I realized, you know, you got to work all day for some of these jobs. Show business, you work, you know, one hour and you're done. So, right. 
and I got to be old. My brother always wanted to be an actor, and he's been an actor his whole life. I, you know, I find acting a little bit boring at times because you're waiting around, waiting around to, you know, come in and hit your mark and say your line and then go back while they set up again. So as I was, my first few acting jobs, I was always looking at how the camera guys work and how the uh, the director works. And when I was doing Peggy Sue Got Married, I mean, I just, I, I looked at that. I would go to the dailies every night. The dailies are when they, you know, you shoot what you shot the day before gets processed, and then the director right. and the camera guys watch to make sure it's all coming out as they want. And mm -hmm. I would go every day to the dailies. Some actors would go just when they were in a scene, and I would go every time, and they go, what are you doing here? And I said, this is like going to film school. I mean, you know, this, yeah. watching Francis, the result of Francis's work, and I would always hang around on the set. Even if I wasn't working that day, I would, you know, and, and talk to him, and he knew – that I wanted to be a director. So he would, you know, I'd, I'd ask him questions and he, you know, he was very forthcoming and sharing, you know, what he was doing in the process. So directing for me was always really probably my first love. Even as a kid, my dad gave us a super eight when Kodak came out with a super eight movie cartridge uh, camera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My dad had done a thing for Kodak. So he gave me one and I made these home movies with my brother and my neighborhood guys. We did the magnificent mm -hmm. seven man, ah. from Monk, Batman. We did all these little films and, uh, you know, I would shoot them and cut them and we would, you know, show them and, you know, and they, they always, they always went over. They were, they were pretty good for the pretty, you know, like costumes and mm -hmm. special effects and, you know, and, and, you know, people getting stabbed. I mean, we had all kinds of stuff in them. So that, I think that's uh, for a lot of directors was where they first started. I mean, today a kid can have a GoPro for 200 bucks and make movies, you know, yeah, you can do it yeah. with an iPhone. I mean, the, you know, when I was a kid, there was, you know, you needed a camera and you needed a film and you had to process the film and you had mm -hmm. to have a guillotine splicer to put it all together. Today, with a Mac, with an Apple computer and a, and a camera, you can, you can make a fee full feature. You can make a TV series. It's, mm -hmm. it's a really wonderful time for young people to get into this business, you know, if that's what you want to do. But it's a business that's tough on you. It's a business that, you know, there's yeah. no guarantees. Um, so, you know, I, I just kind of... It, it seemed like the only way for me to go when I was a kid. I mean, I liked it. I think I, I think I had my sights on Hollywood uh, when I when I got out of Gainesville when I was a sophomore. I, right. I wanted to go to UCLA Film School because Gainesville only had journalism, and you know they had kind of a UHF TV station. Right. So right. I went out there and I was taking classes with Paul Schrader, and I was taking writing class with Rod Serling, and I was going. At Jonathan Winters taught a comedy class. George Carlin oh. taught a comedy class. I was in the heart of you know the real. Uh, right. Hollywood uh, experts is sharing their knowledge, so I, I was like a sponge for my first couple of years in Los Angeles. Yeah, that was the, the I got lucky too when I got out there. I, I I auditioned for the Groundlings. Didn't happen the first couple times I auditioned. Robin Williams stepped in and helped me get with the Groundlings, and uh, I always just wanted to be a, a talk show host. Actually, I, I never I did Hill Street Blues. I did St. Elsewhere. I did a lot of acting stuff because at Carnegie Mellon, where I went for a while. Uh, right. Stephen Boschko was one of the professors there. So I got, you know, the five and under stuff a lot, which helped pay the right. bills back in the seventies and eighties. You know, the rents weren't anywhere near where they are today. You know, my first place was up, uh, on uh, Franklin and La Brea, uh -huh. that old by the up, magic castle up there. Yeah. By the magic castle. And, and, but I, I got my start there doing stuff and enjoyed it. And, and, you know, I got to be on set, but I never was interested really in directing. I was more interested in actually interviewing people and finding out what makes them tick. What was the best advice your dad ever gave you? Uh, about what? About show business? Yeah, about the business itself. I mean, because you, <laughs> you and Ken have both prospered. I don't know what your sister does, but, I mean, Ken has been on General Hospital, what, 30, 35 years? He's been on 38 years playing the same character. He has very limited range. Yeah. Yes, but he's he's been like Tony Gary. He's sustained. Yeah, Tony finally retired. Yeah, no, he's been John Bernardino. Some of the old. He's been on on and off. You know, he comes and goes. Yeah. Uh, I I uh, you know he always from like, when he was a kid he got cast in like a Jesus Christ superstar play when, at UCLA when we were like I don't know 12 years old to play the young Jesus and my dad uh, didn't want, didn't let him do it. My mom who was a dancer her whole life she was an acrobatic dancer. You know they, neither one of them encouraged us at all to get into show business because yeah. they knew how hard it was. They knew what it, you know the challenges were and you know the, the ups and downs. Uh, my son is a, a third generation comedian. He's doing stand up and acting and everything else. And I, I tried to reverse on him. I told him, "Come on in. Oh, it's great. You can't spend all the money you make. It's beautiful. You'll love yeah. it. It's so easy." <laughs> but, and I think thinking that would dis dissuade, you know, dis discourage him. But he he jumped in hook, line, and sinker, and he's uh 
he's now uh, doing stand up, and he's he just opened for Kevin Nealon last week in Burbank, and I just opened for Kevin Nealon yesterday in, or Saturday in St. Pete. Yeah. So he's you know he's coming along, and uh, Kevin paid him a good compliment. He's, he's he's got a good stage presence. He's got a you know a confidence on stage. Now he just needs like every comic needs material, material, material. Mm-hmm. You know, if you were in the Groundlings, you know, you guys learned how to listen. You learned how to bounce off of each other. You learned how to do improv, which is a tremendous tool. Oh yeah. In, in an actor's toolbox, you know, because listening, you know, comics are pretty much about you know me, 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 me. Right. But improv actors, you know, it's about you know setting up and giving and exchanging and you know and and listening and and reacting and and mm. uh, I, you know I think it's like I I studied with um with the old Harvey Lembeck group. Harvey Lembeck oh. was, uh, was um that, Harvey was you know the guy Eric von Zipper on the old Beach Party movie. And yes, I a, loved him. I loved him. Yeah, he had a he had a he went he had Michael his son has become a you know big time sitcom director as well and Michael directed the Santa Claus two and some other movies but but Michael taught the class and Bill Hudnut taught the class and it was a great class and I was in there with Chris Lemon Jack Lemon's son mm-hmm. and a bunch of young actors and you know I I got to say that improv was was an important tool for anybody to have have some experience in. Oh, yeah, because it gives you a great foundation. I had in my class, of all people, at the Groundlings, when I started studying there, Kevin Costner and Bob Saget. Oh, yeah, I've known Bob. I've known Bob since the early days. Yeah. Bob, yeah. yeah. I used to direct – Bob had a sitcom called Raising Dad on the WB. Yeah. And he was on – I directed about nine of those, and he – Bobby and I have been friends since we were since we started the Westwood Comedy Store. But but the, Bob had a daughter on the show. One daughter was Kat Jennings, mm-hmm. Kate, Kate Kate Demings from who the one is on Two Blo- Broke Girls, mm-hmm. Kat, Kat Denning, and the other daughter was Brie Larson, who is now the star of this movie Room, and she's getting Oscar buzz. And to, and Jerry Adler, who was you know the great Jerry Adler from The Sopranos and everything else, was the dad. It mm-hmm. was such a fun time, and I I I took Bree from that show and put her in my movie that I did, Hoot, and she was the lead in that movie, and she's just a great talent, and she's she's gone on to star in this movie Room, which is uh, it, you'll hear about it just coming out in the next couple of weeks, and uh, her, yeah. her is mother she... is played by Joan Allen, who played my wife and Peggy Sue got married, so it's a small world. Did uh, is she as are they as funny as as him? Of course, I can't imagine that because, frankly, he could he's like Jonathan Winters, Bob. He could take anything and make it funny. Oh, Bob! Well, Bob, you know, Bob has no filter. You know, Bob. No. Uh, he's a, no. He's got a very dark sense of humor, and any, he'll, anything will come out of his mouth. So, but uh, you know, I love Bob. Uh, he's a real talent, and he just keeps going. I mean, they're doing Fuller House now. They're bringing that back. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, I think it's a, more about the kids. But Bob and Dave Fouillet are going to be in it, and Stamos is going to be in it. You know, it's and it, you know, it's it, people love that show. Um, right. right. I mean, and so. it, and a kid, another kid from South Florida is in there. Uh, I grew up with his dad, so he's sort of like my unofficial nephew, and that's Scott Wanger, who played Steve, yeah. who played his right, uh, right. DJ's boyfriend. Do you know how many guys I was thinking the other day that came from South Florida that are you know doing pretty well? I mean, I'm not in your category because of of where I'm at, but you know, Kelsey Grammer grew up at the same time we did in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, Kelsey went to Pinecrest, and Kelsey uh, gave money to Pinecrest to build for the theater. Yeah. Uh, Kelsey, uh, yeah, I knew Kelsey. I was here. I went to Cardinal Gibbons in 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 Fort Lauderdale, and, and Kelsey went to Pinecrest. And uh, yeah, we talked about it when I first started directing Frazier. We would always talk about Fort Lauderdale. Some of the of of our mutual friends would sometimes show up on the set, and we would both cringe, you know, because yeah. you know when you're on a sitcom, you want to just get the work done. You don't have time yeah. to visit with your old high school buddies. But uh, yeah, Kelsey's from here. Johnny Depp is from here. I mean, I'm you know, from there. Of, yeah, yeah. I went to Hollywood. Here. I went to Hollywood Hills. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, now here's something I wanted to bring up with you because, uh, and then we'll get back into the comedy. In 1970. Your siblings and you suffered a major tragedy. Your mom and dad were killed in an automobile accident. How did that help shape you and Ken and your sister, Indy, in, for the rest of your life? Because uh, I know what it's like to go without a mom and a dad for a long period of time. And, uh, I lost mine. Not, I took care of mine for 10 years before I lost them. But uh, how did that help shape you? And, and I do have a question after you answer that from one of our listeners. Well, it's, you know, it wasn't an easy thing. I was 16 years old. My brother and I were 16. My sister was 18. We were, you know, we just, you know, one day, you know, we were, I was away. I was going to a, uh, a boarding school, an all boys, uh, uh, Episcopal boarding school. 
and uh, you get a call to come to the office in the morning and they take you home and they tell you your parents are dead and yeah. you know it's a big it's a big shock and it's in, and uh, you know suddenly you realize you know your life is whatever you whatever you make of your life is up to you now you know nobody's giving you any guidance nobody's you know telling you you know and you just kind of you know you you know I went through you know I went through you know some crazy years we living wild and uh, you know right. and I finally figured out what I wanted to do uh, I think having a focus in life is is really important and I yes. you know I knew I wanted to go to Hollywood and get into show business and my brother was kind of he was hanging around here you know what he wanted to do we were driving taxis in Fort Lauderdale and I said let's um I'm going to L.A. I'm going to get into UCLA Film School and uh, you want to come and so we were 20 years old we flew to L.A. and we couldn't even rent a car we got a cab into West Hollywood. Got an apartment and started looking for a part place to live and a car to drive and, uh, right. and you know life started and for me fortunately I threw myself into my into my desired career and you know and here I am you know 40 years later you know still doing it so I guess right. it was the right choice yeah um, you know I don't think it's easy for anybody I mean I'm, I'm I was with a friend of mine whose parents are you know you know going through dementia and you know mm. they're you know they're in the waning years of their lives and that's got to be hard that's got to be equally hard to watch yes parents. it is it is i watched an uncle of mine who was a captain for pan am sit right across the way from my dad in 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 our condo and my uncle jim didn't have a clue who anybody was he kept calling me butch and other names and he kept looking at my dad like uh you know didn't i fly with you once or something and of course they never flew together they both worked for two different airlines so yeah, it, it, it can be bad. The question is, my dear friend Will, is it true getting into the film industry is really about who you know? And if so, can you introduce me to the right people to make my film? Um, that's from one of well, our listeners. Well, it's not out. about, you know, that the, the, yeah, I used to say it's who you know. And, you know, it's really, I mean, it's really a combination of luck and being in the right place and, and meeting the right guy that's looking for the project. I mean, there, you know, if you're, you know, yeah, if you're Ricky Martin, if you're Dean Martin's kid, or if you're Herb Shriner's kid, sure, there's some curiosity when you first get to town and mm-hmm. and let's see who this guy is. But you know, it might get you in the door, but it doesn't get you the job. I mean, getting the job, it's all about preparation. It's all about doing the homework. I mean, I right. I literally was a, a two year sponge in writing, directing, editing, cinematography. I mean, all the tools. And then my first job was working for Max Bear, who was Jethro on uh, Beverly Hillbillies. Yes. Was making a movie in Mississippi, and I, for a hundred bucks a week, said, "Can I come and work on the movie?" And they said, "Well, you." And I said, "I'll fly myself there. Just give me a place to live and give me per diem." And I went and I worked for eight weeks in each depart, a different department every week. I was mm-hmm. in editing. I was in transportation. I was in post. I was in you know, work with the camera guys. I worked with the, you know the, with the production managers. And I learned so much that when I went back to Hollywood and went back to UCLA Film School, mm-hmm. you know, I was way ahead of everybody else because I had made a work on a real movie. And, and I think if you get a chance, you know, not you, but if any young people listening, you know, get a chance to go and work on a movie as a PA, that's when I gave my son a job as a PA on the movie I made down here. Hoot with uh, right. We made a movie uh, with Jimmy Buffett and Carl Hyacinth's best-selling book, Kids Book, and uh, my kid, my son worked as a PA. My daughter was an act, had a little part in it. My brother had a part in it. You know, sure, it helped that they got the part over somebody else uh, because they they were they knew me. But uh, you know, they were also good. They were, but they did a good job. And uh, yeah. I think you know, I think the the when you get an opportunity, I mean, for us with our movie, I, I it's a long story how it came about. But you know, Jimmy had optioned the book, and he asked me to read the book and see what I thought. And I said, make a great movie. He goes, well, I own the writes to it, yeah, what do you, how do we do that? And I go, well, let's talk about it. So he, I, and Carl all met in the Keys, and I said, you know, I think since nobody's optioned the book, why don't we get a great script that we like and then go out with the script? And, you know, mm-hmm. it's easier to buy a script than a book right. because people can see it. So we, uh, I, wrote, I said, I'll write the script if I can direct it. So I, I said, I'll write it, you know, for scale, which is Writer's Guild scale. So right. I went away and I wrote it and I gave it to Carl and Carl gave me notes and then I gave then I gave it to Jimmy and Jimmy gave me notes and they said this is really good we like this so then they gave it to Frank Marshall I turned on my final draft and they gave it to Frank Marshall and Frank is a real producer I mean he did Jurassic Park he's done you know all the M Night Shyamalan films all the Spielberg films and Frank had some great notes on the script and I said you know he's right he's one he wanted to develop the arc with the boy and his dad and all this other stuff. So I said, no, he's right. He, that, I said, I'm going to go back and fix all this stuff and based on his notes. And so I did. And, he, you know, they were all appreciative because I did it for free because, you know, basically I wanted to get the movie made. And we went to Walden Media, which is um, a big – they were big into making kids' movies 
mm-hmm. out of books. They did Chronicles of Narnia, and they did Holes, and they did Win Dixie, and they did Bridges of Arabia, and they, they, and they, in our first meeting, we went in, they read the script, and we had a meeting, and they said, oh yeah, okay, and we left, and we got on the plane to go to Vegas because uh, Jimmy was working in Vegas, and when we landed, we got a call from Frank, hey, we're making the movie. You know, oh, and I said, well, oh. what? And we, you know, we went out and celebrated. And then they said, well, let's get, you know, let's get Andy Davis to direct it. Let's get somebody to rewrite it. And they were like, no, 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 no. This is this is our guy. This is the guy we came in with. This is the guy we want to stand behind. And you That's know, cool. to, to their credit, they they backed me up as the as the you know, because I was although I was a director, I wasn't a film director. And uh, you know, and we had a great time going through that process. No, well, you and can direct me. Out. You can direct me anytime, my friend. Here's a qu- here's another question. Uh, what if you have the script written, a budget, a breakdown? Where should one turn from there? Well, you know, the script speaks for itself. You know, the budget is the budget. You know, I, I have another script of another Hyacinth script of, of his other kids' book of his. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Hoot was a $14 million movie. You know, today they want to make kids' films for 3 or $4 million. You know, and, you know, yeah. you can make a movie for any number, it's just that you know, like you know, how many, how many, you know, how many aerial days you got, how many, how big's the production, how big's the footprint, you know. We shot ours on, on thirty-five Panavision, and you know, the, those days are gone. Yes. Everything shot on HD now, and it's a lot, it's a lot quicker, a lot cheaper. The, 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 the number of costs are brought down by the digital, you know, the entry into digital. Mm-hmm. Um, but the script sells itself. I mean, that's what that's what got my movie made was you know they read the script and they loved it. And, uh, you know, of course, they want to change it right away, but they, you know, they, and, and that's the case that and every movie gets rewritten a dozen times, you know, oh, that's yeah. the way it is. it's like a TV show, the show you start on Monday, if you're shooting a five day show on Monday, <laughs> you table read and, you know, the places that it needs shoring up gets rewritten, you know, every day until Friday, by the time what you shoot on Friday is sometimes not even close to what you start, what you read on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. But you always did a great you always did a great job with Frazier because I would always see your name in the credits and stuff. And it was always fantastic. Uh, There's a question for me. Would you believe this? Who did I play on St. Elsewhere? I played a variety of roles, uh, Margie. I I did a five and under, which is five lines or less, which I guess now today will is considered a co-star. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Whatever they call them, different things now. Yeah, uh, you know. It, it, I mean, you know, if you have if you have lines, you're basically, you know, you're sag. You're going to get residuals. You know, you're yeah. going to get. You know, it's it, it's it's. You know, my son just did a pilot for USA Today. It's a it's a period uh, piece that takes place that takes place around a studio in, in the forties. And you know, he's he's the lead guy's assistant. You know, he's got three lines, and I say, yeah. hey, don't worry about it. You know, the. Sh- First of all, the show's got to get picked up, and if it does, yeah. you don't get replaced. You know, I mean, it's such a, you know, it's such a. <coughs> there's so many, um, you know, variables in what will take you to the next level. Now, you, yeah. you, you are you still doing your, the Jay Leno thing? Uh, once in a great while, I'm flying out to uh, San Diego to do something, uh, and I found out today that on my flight back, I got to do a red eye out of San Diego, which doesn't make me happy. But yeah, I'm still doing it from time to time. I, yeah, I. I have a lot of fun doing it. You know, as a matter of fact, I got permission from him in order to do it because I didn't want to say anything or do anything. And he said, as long as you don't embarrass me in public, I don't care, Gary. Just go do it. Have fun with it. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, hey, I'm sure you go, I'm sure you go at, you know, a much better price than Jay gets. Jay gets big money, you know. You yeah. Know? Yeah, I'm flying. I'm, I'm funny. I'm, it's funny. You know, do you, do you write do you write your own stuff for that or do you do some of his stuff? How does that work? I'm writing. I'm writing mostly myself. When he was on the air, I'd steal something here or there. And of course, in the corporate world, which I know you have a great deal uh, to do with, uh, because you have a relationship with Bill Gates and other corporations. When I do corporate things as an MC for an event, uh, I would do maybe some jaywalking if I got there a day or two ahead of time with some people. We'd have a camera crew, or or I did or I did uh, funniest uh, not funniest home videos, but um, I would do uh, uh, headlines. I mean, I would try to incorporate it into a whole show, a whole Tonight Show with Jay Leno. I mean, I came here to Orlando once at the uh, and did an entire week, and each day would be a 15-minute segment of what he would do in his opening, either monologue or or jaywalking or headlines or or whatever. And it was so much fun to do. But I sort of got tired of it, and I still do it. But I, you know, I just wanted to be Gary again, you know, because you know I look yeah, so yeah, much. Well, like, yeah, I mean- 
you know, I, I, I look so much like him, you know, and it's 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 that that stopped me from getting TV commercials and movie roles and everything after a while when he became popular because they'd say, Gary, we love you and you're talented, but we don't want Jay Leno in our production. So, you know, it it kind of and so that's why the the talk show stuff kept going. Well, the talk show, hey, the talk, you know, the talk show is the best job in the business. You're a curious guy. You ask questions. I I was writing for the morning David Letterman show back in 1980. Yeah. Barry Stan, the producer, said, you know, and we were live 90 minutes every morning. Uh, people don't remember, but this was the David's first show. Right. Uh, it was called the David Letterman Show, and it was from 10 to 1130 live on NBC. And Barry Sand said to me, listen, if David uh, doesn't come in to work for some whatever reason, I'm putting you in the chair. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, you, you'd be good. I'll put you in the chair. And I thought, well, well I better pay attention and see how this works and, you know, learn yeah. how – you know, learn how to do it a little bit. And yeah. then, you know, I, that, that went away and I started doing some other stuff. I was doing, uh, some other TV stuff. I did a show called bloopers and practical jokes with Dick Clark and all that right. stuff. And I was doing these different shows and then along came this opportunity to be in Peggy Sue got married. So I, I, uh, my manager, I was me and Jim Carrey and Kathleen Turner, and Nick Cage. And, you know, my manager was like, I get you more money. I don't want more money. I just want to be in this movie, you know? Yeah. So I took the movie and I did that for, I don't know, we did it for almost uh, five months. And I came back and I did an Amazing Stories episode for Steven Spielberg and uh, Kevin Reynolds directed. It was a great one with Charlie Durning. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I'm going to be an actor. This I got two big credits and I did then I did a I did something else. I did a Dream On for, uh, for John Landis. Right. And I thought, I'm on my way to having an acting career. And uh-huh. Group W was developing a talk show for Alan Thicke. Mm-hmm. Uh, daytime talk show and Alan Thicke got growing pains and yeah. you know and and skip hit you know hit the road and Westinghouse thought well you know we still think there's a market for a daytime television talk show right. and so one of the guys over there came to me and said would you be interested and I was it always been in the back of my head yeah you know I always thought I would like to do a talk show so I said sure I'd be interested and they said, okay, well, we'll make a deal with you, and we're going to send you around the country to our stations. And they had a station in Boston and San Francisco and mm-hmm. Baltimore and, and uh, uh, New York. Uh, no, not New York. Boston, Baltimore, oh, D.C. and San Francisco yeah. and Pittsburgh. And I, and I would go and fill in for a week on the morning People Are Talking show. And it was like a you know a talk, you know, like a, a morning like the Today show, but local. Right. Right, and I had a ball doing it, and I worked with Tom Bergeron, who was the guy in Boston. I worked with Oprah Winfrey, who was in Baltimore. In Baltimore, and, yeah, yep, yeah, and you know, and and uh, and they so they cut it all together, and they made a pilot, and they went to Napty, and they sold it to 110 <laughs> markets, and the next thing I know, I got my own talk show, and you know, uh, and it was a, a lot of fun to do. It yes. came at a time when light-hearted talk, what what Ellen DeGeneres does today. Right. was what we were attempting to do was a light, you know, kind of fun show. But right. it was right at the time when Geraldo and Maury Povich and, and, mm. and uh, all of the Donahue, they were all of that tabloid kind of shows. And, and those were really taken off. And the, you know, the Mike Douglas, Mer Griffin sort yes. of, you know, light talk was, was waning. So right. we only made it, we did 200 hour shows and we didn't get another season out of it. But I, you know, to, to this day, I, you know, Jenny Jones came after me and, who else? I mean, there's you know there's you got oh guys. Ricky Ricky Lake came after Ricky you. Lake. I mean, yeah, there's I mean yeah. this guy Steve Wilkos who was Jerry yeah. Springer's you know bodyguard now has right. his own show been on ten years you know yeah so you know the... could have been a long run you know but I didn't uh, well, whatever it was bad timing. Well, you know I, I I used to be afraid of the people on stage with Springer. Now I'm afraid of the audience. <laughs> yeah. I mean I really am. Hey, who makes you laugh? I mean uh, you know you, you you come from. You have been around comedians as much as I have, uh, particularly Saget. And, of course, I was very fortunate to be good friends with Robin. Uh, Rick Overton, of course, I've been around, uh, and, and many, many others, uh, Glenn Hirsch. And, of course, I have a Bill Maher story that I want to share with you in a little bit because I know you did Politically Incorrect. I have a Bill Maher yeah. story of me and Tubby in New York at Catch. At Catch. But who makes you laugh? I mean, uh, I don't like dirty humor. For instance, I don't, oh, I don't get... you know, the kids, the young kids with the, you know, the, that's in the clubs and the, uh, you know, the, the vulgarity, I don't like that. You know, I, yeah, I just saw, I saw Robin when he was here at the Hard Rock and I mean, just, mm-hmm. it was like an hour and a half of just, you know, pure adrenaline. 
Right. Robin was so strong. This was a few years ago, you know, before we lost him. Yeah. Uh, Richard, uh, you know who was just here was Martin Short and Steve Martin. I mean, two of my oh, favorites. Oh, God. You know, uh, I just I just did two nights on the road with Kevin Neal, and Kevin's a very funny guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, Lewis Black makes me laugh. I mean, the, yeah. of the younger guys, you know, there's there's a lot of the younger guys that are coming up. I mean, Chris Rock, uh, right. I think, it's, you know, just he's funny, he's smart, you know. Yep. Uh, remember, there, remember, you know, re- remember when the day will... When in order to get on the Tonight Show, you couldn't be filthy just to be filthy. You had to be clean, and and boy, you could you could audition a hundred times and maybe maybe even not even get on the Tonight Show. Well, Jim McCauley, who booked the Tonight Show, he had a he knew what Johnny liked, and Johnny had a certain taste in comics. Johnny liked line clever lines, you know, like clever material, you know, and the people that really shined on the Tonight Show, the Stephen Wrights and the Jerry Seinfelds and Ellen and. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the people that came on there and, and scored and came back, I, I did about, I don't know, 14 Tonight Shows with Johnny. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it was always about making Johnny laugh. You know, that was the goal, was to get on the show and then get the panel and then get to talk to Johnny and get make mm-hmm. him laugh. And in those days, my manager was handling Doc Severinsen. So, I you know, he, they would play poker up at their, his apartment. And, I mean, I'd be up there, you know, I'd come up there early just to, you know, they would have dinner before the poker game. Right. Just try to, you know, talk to get to know Johnny. And Johnny was a very aloof, you know, he was very shy, very quiet. But, I mean, Johnny was such a fan of comedy. Johnny Mm -hmm. Johnny loved comedy. And, he was a, you know, know, he was influenced by Jack Benny. He was influenced by Jonathan Winters. Jonathan Winters, I took a class with. Jonathan Winters lived on the beach next door to a girl I was going out with. And Mm -hmm. I used to just go see her just so I could hang out on the beach and talk to Jonathan. Jonathan was Jonathan was a hoot. I saw him in Depars one day, and for those of you that aren't familiar with this, this is a chain of restaurants in the valley. And he, before he left, he said hello to everybody and did a routine. Yeah, no, Jonathan was always on. You know, he was. He, you know, I, all all those old guys. Buddy Hackett used to bite. Buddy Hackett used to say, "Bring bring six of your comic young comic friends over to the house for you know kosher lunch." And yeah. he would lecture us on comedy, and he'd have Louis Nye there and Tom Post in there, and we would just yeah. talk about structure and, and, and com- you know, when you start to analyze comedy, it, yeah. it kind of takes the funny out of it. But, you know, there, there is, there are, there is, there are tools, there is a, there is a, a you know, a mechanism that we use, you know, and there, I mean, I, I don't really want to go into it, but there's, you know, there's understatement surprise, but basically, yeah. you know, comedy has a victim and, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's all about, uh, sometimes it's yourself and self-deprecating, right. sometimes it's, you know, if it's Rickles and insult you, I mean, I did this video for Bill Gates, his retirement, uh, and uh, we had Rickles in it, we had Carrot Top in it, I mean, and it was, and Bill had no idea where the funny was. I mean, here's a guy who's, you know, probably one of the richest men in the world, who right. didn't understand any jokes, and I had to, and I think that's what he liked about me, because I was always, you know, kind of calling him on it, you know. Right. I, I wanted a joke about this giant computer that we built for the show, and I said, you know, Tell them that they you, they wouldn't believe the trouble you had getting it in the overhead bin on the flight down here. And he, yeah. <laughs> he didn't know what he meant. He didn't know what it meant. And I said, you know, Bill, remember when you used to fly on a commercial flight, how you had to put your luggage up above? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. I go, yeah, Bill, I think you're losing touch, you know, yeah. with the common yeah. man. Absolutely. But, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's funny. I was friends with, with Buddy, too, because Sandy Hackett and I have been friends for a lot of years. He's been on this show as well. It's amazing yeah, how you're out there doing the Rat Pack. I just saw him here. He was doing uh, Joey Bishop in a show. He was at the Parker Playhouse, it's, and Sandy stole the show. I mean, you know, yeah. I thought I thought he was the best one in the show. I mean, the Sam, this, the guy that did Sammy was okay. The guy that did Dean was okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Sandy had brought the jokes and brought the fun, and he was like the highlight of the show. I've known Sandy for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I knew I knew Sandy when he got started doing comedy in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, then when I went out to Las Vegas, we became friends again. And, uh, you know, we talked from time to time. I haven't talked to him in quite a while because I've been busy. Let's talk about comedians for a second before we move on to you as a director. Um, Are comedians born, and we've kind of discussed that a little bit, or can they learn the techniques and be a a technician at it? I mean, uh, let's face it, Robin Williams, there aren't many of those guys born every day. Oh, and by the way, before I go too far, I just want to say, I don't get Sarah Silverman's humor, no matter how hard I try. She's one comedian. I just don't get her humor at all whatsoever. Well, there's a whole there's a whole sort of Largo crowd of comics that have come up, you know, the Andy Kindlers and the uh, some of the guys that come out of that. Uh, it's a it's a different school of comedy, and uh, you know sometimes it makes me laugh, sometimes it doesn't. It's not it's not 100 percent for me. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I know a lot of people love Louis C.K. and Louis C.K. is a very funny comic, very funny stand-up. Right. But you know, I, 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 you know, I don't know. I, you know, it, comedy's subjective, and you know, you, you know, the goal as a comedian is, is if you've got a thousand people in a room, is that you're going to say something that you know, nine hundred of those people are going to get and find amusing. You're never going to get all thousand. Right. And uh, you know, the comedy's not for everybody. You know, I, I find Sarah Silverman a, a couple things she's done funny. She's, you know, the irreverence. This is the the new generation. You know, I, I'm a guy that I I like jokes. I like you know people that have you know a clever right. you know a, a clever take on stuff. I mean, to me, Chris Rock sometimes with his stuff about you know you want to put gun control in effect. You know, you should make the price of bullets expensive. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean that's just it's just you know he says if a guy's got you know bullets are five thousand bucks a piece and the guy's got three in the back of the head, he really had it coming. I mean, Chris Rock. <laughs> you know, he, I like guys that 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 say something intellectual or something you know astute that mm-hmm. is also funny it's also a clever observation you know, <laughs> right. I, you know I, i'm a huge letterman fan i mean i'm a huge you know i mean i'm a huge fan of you know i mean george carlin was you know one of the greats i mean oh, I, yeah. I, I worked george watched george work many times and uh and you know it's, it's just a, it's a sense of style i'll laugh at something silly you know I, I love rickles i mean i love you know i mean oh you yeah know, silly stuff makes me laugh I, I you know i i think you can i think you can learn it i think you know the best way to learn it i mean it's funny a lot of guys that have done well in the comedy business and and some of them were doormen at the improv some of them were waiters you know at, at the comedy store mm-hmm. that just were around it and watched what worked and eventually <laughs> you know uh, you know, figured it out. I mean, right. my son, I tell him all the time, you know, go to these open mic nights and see what guys are doing, see what works, see what doesn't work. Right. You know, an open mic is a tough room because oh, you know, yeah. it's mostly you bring your friends in. It's not a real audience, you know. No. Uh, it, it's it's sort of people coming, you know, as we like to say, it's, it's you know, it's like, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's wolves coming around to, you know, see somebody get hurt, you know, for, to, to see somebody. Oh, it's, lose. it's, it's the Romans and the Christians. I'm telling you, man, it's, Tubby used to hire people to come in and heckle me just so I could get over it and learn how to handle with hecklers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I well, mean, I mean, yeah, my my son got razzled a few times by hecklers, and he's learned now how to deal with. It. I mean, you you got to if so, if something happens in the room, you have to address it. You know, if somebody yells something out that everybody hears, you know, and you mm-hmm. go, you know, they then the audience they know you got frazzled by it. So if you mm-hmm. if you got to come back, you know, that's that's yeah. you know that's that's it's an important thing to do. I mean, you can, you can, there's a lot of books on how to do comedy. There's a lot of books on, you know, how to write comedy, you mm-hmm. know, but you, you have a funny, you either have a funny, you know, an eye for funny. Carlin used to say, comedian's job is to either look at a picture and tilt his perspective of the picture mm-hmm. and comment on what he sees at an angle or look at the picture, look at the picture straight on and then tilt the picture, you know, so one way or the other, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're skewing your perspective of what we all see as normal. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think from that vantage point comes the funny. You know, I mean, a lot of comedians, uh, you know, are comics because they didn't get enough love. They need the love of the audience. There's all kinds of things. You know, I had horrible childhoods. Right. That's not true. I mean, you know, Seinfeld had a you know normal childhood. I had a yeah. fairly normal childhood. You know, I mean... Uh, when I was a kid, Woody Allen used to come over to our house and write jokes for my dad. I mean, so, you know, I, I grew up around comedy. When I got to meet Woody Allen a number of years ago, right. he, he, he reminisced. <laughs> he would come over and write jokes for five bucks a piece and give them to my dad. And I have the orig- I have some of the files still of those jokes. Wow. Some of them were horrible. You oh, know, yeah. Here's the young Woody Allen, right? You know, wanted, you know, he wanted, it was kind of like the pre, uh, I think it was in one of the movies, the front or one of the movies where he was a gag writer. And that's, you know, that's how he got started. But, I mean, here's a guy who's, you know, done yeah. now 40, 50 movies, you know, who's such a prolific, hardworking uh, comedy filmmaker. I mean, I live in awe of, of his work ethic and the ability to crank that out. Right. My friend Carl Hyacin writes two books a year. I don't, I don't know how he does it. You know, he, he, he has a discipline I don't have. Yeah, they, they writers immerse themselves into the subject matter. They literally marry it because uh, I've had a number of writers on the show here. I want to get over to you as a director I, I i on your website you have uh pilots of the caribbean and i just i loved it man uh, being a flying oh yeah that's a, that's just a presentation well, yeah i figured you love it. yeah we shot some great stuff that we shot a lot of that with a gopro and uh i i met the guy i was going to a party in the bahamas uh a friend of mine was managing a private <laughs> island for you know they've got a lot of these billionaires in the and he was quitting so he said i'm mm-hmm. having a party at my island come down 
So I flew over with the guy, Clyde, that's in this thing, and, you know, he was talking. He goes, hey, you think there's a reality show in what I do? I said, hey, as far as I'm concerned, there's a reality show in anything these days. And they have Honey right. Boo Boo and the Kardashians and, you know, there's, there's, and these house shows. And, you know, I said, you know, who, there's a reality show. If, if you're interesting and what you do is interesting and you get a bunch of characters around you. So um, he said, well, I'll put up the money to shoot a little sizzle. We call it sizzle reel. So right. we shot that thing. About he flies stuff over for David Copperfield. He's got a private island over there and a few other right. people that he flies for. And, uh, you know, I just was going to revisit it because, you know, every year there's a whole new setup. We took it to the Travel Channel and they liked it, but they weren't sure that they liked the guy. And then we took it to the History Channel and they said, oh, make it crazier, you know. And so we got a drag queen and a giant snake. And, you know, <laughs> and it's, everybody has an opinion of what they want to see. Right. So, you know, I said to this guy, I said, well, let's just do like a 10 minute episode and we'll see if we can sell it. So uh, I'm about to take it out and, you know, sh- shop it some more because, you know, you go out a few places and you get shut down and you kind of, you know, you lose a little bit of, of confidence, a little bit of momentum on it. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, we were flying. We we're flying. I flew a Baron. I was sitting in the left seat. I flew a 58 Baron into a 1500 foot strip with ocean on each side. And, you uh-huh. know, that Baron needs about it needs about 1,300 feet of runway, so it was a it was a challenge. But but this guy is a character. He was a you know he was a drug runner in the 70s, and he, he yeah. went and worked for the CIA and flew a contract work uh, in and out of the jungles of Colombia during the drug days. And you know there's a show on on, on Netflix called um, uh, Narcos, and mm-hmm. I mean he was well, he was one of those guys, you know. So I I still think his story is interesting, and I still you know I'm still trying to push that up the hill, you know. Well, if you ever want a broken down talk show host on for some kind of a reality check, let me know. <laughs> right, I mean, yeah. You know, uh, listen, you worked with some great directors. You worked with uh, Francis Ford Coppola, who I worked with uh, in, in Apocalypse Now, as well as uh, The Godfather. I did a, an extra. I was an extra in the wedding scene. You also worked with John Landis, Max Baer, Jethro in the Cement Pond. And Mark Tinker, which is Mary Tyler Moore's, I believe, son. Yeah, and I did a. Uh, Mark had a show called <laughs> Capital News with Lloyd Bridges and uh, and uh, Michael Woods. Yeah, that was mm-hmm. one of that was the old uh, MTM, and and I I knew Botchko uh, from I used to play and ski up in that tournament that he had every year. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, what was I going to say? The uh, you know you know you get to work with the great guys, and you you know you watch them and do what they do. You know, for you, if you, if you see yourself in The Godfather, what a credit that is to be. Yeah. In the well, I mean, if you if you actually able to see me, Will, you're you're very lucky. I can't even spot me, and I know where I was. Oh, you know? okay, yeah, because they were shooting Lenny. They were shooting Lenny with Dustin Hoffman here at the Fort Lauderdale Courthouse, and I was I was I think eighteen or nineteen years old, and I, they wanted us to be extras, you know, because we had had long hair at the time, and it was yeah. you know, sort of that look. And I just you know I think ah, why didn't I do that? You know, I don't know, <laughs> you know. But I did get a great impression of uh, of uh, of uh, Marlon, though, that I do all the time. You know, if anybody brings up anything to do with the mafia or anything, I always do that. What does a director need uh, when you get the script? I mean, and it's probably the same thing for television. Of course, you worked on Gilmore Girls, which I just read something today that it's yeah, going to be on Netflix. Back. Yeah, and that that'd be good for you. Uh, and you worked I with Kelsey. Know. You know, I, you know, I liked uh, Lauren Graham was great. The young girl was kind of a, you know, she was a lot of work. <laughs> well, some, well, you know, I have a buddy of mine who's on the young and the restless and he's been on that show for like 30 years. He's, he's one of the big actors on that show. And I asked him once about the young actors coming in. He said, they're, they're talented, but they just don't have the panache. They just don't have the class about them that, that we did coming along feeling grateful for, for the opportunity and, and watching people on set. They, they think they know it all. You know, and well, they all want to be famous too. You know, they, you know, the idea of doing your homework and doing theater and being in shows and re- mm-hmm. and having a discipline of rehearsing and making stuff better. I mean, that that there's a work ethic you have to have, I think, to make it. You know, right. you know there's a lot of people that get lucky and get a Disney show built around them or whatever. But you know, to you know, to to really, you know, the really quality actors uh, that go, you know, that go on and have, you know, this is a business, and Johnny said it best. This is a business. Carson said this is a business that it eats its young, yep. and basically it eats you up and spits you out and move on to the next young person because you're young, you're inexperienced, you're cheap, you're un, you're you're you haven't had any failure. So the agents are all out there. You know, they, it's it's a lot easier to sell somebody who's never done anything. Right. It is to tell somebody who had a career and, you know, maybe had a stumble or two and it's, you know, it's hard to come back. And, 
And when I was doing my talk show, I had, you know, I don't know, I had, I had five guests a day, so I probably had a thousand guests on. The nicest people were the people who had a career right. and it, it lost it and then were coming back for a second time around. They they had a great perspective on what it all meant. And, you know, and it's it's a business, you know, show business, it's, you know, we, you've heard this a million times. It's a business more than it it's is. about show. It's about no, the, the, What we're doing here is is my preparation over the weekend getting ready for you because remember I contacted you and said hey uh, where do I find this out about you other than your website I I have more questions here than I absolutely need to get through an interview with you uh, which is the way I prepare I love preparing I love doing the research I love finding out what is it that makes Will tick you know and I've known you a long time but I mean still I want to make well, sure that I cover that out. it let me know oh I will I will uh, we've got about an email. We got about we got about four minutes, so I'm going to call you anyway. Um, you did the Hollywood Squares, and you were in the center square. Did Paul Lynn leave any of his laughter behind? Yeah, well, I love Paul Lynn. No, I did the center squares with John Davidson. That, that was the original Peter Marshall squares, right? With uh, with Paul Lynn, and I and I'm still friends with Peter Marshall, who's one of the Peter Marshall's about ninety, and he can tell you what he had for lunch in 1932. He's one of the sharpest guys I've ever met. Yeah. Um, no, Hollywood Squares was fun. I, 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 Joan Rivers was the center square, and for some reason, she was gone that week, so they gave me the, the role in the center square. But I used to do, you know, the corners a lot. I did a, We went to the Bahamas with Hollywood Squares. This right. was the, the the John Davidson one. Yeah. And then it came along, and they were looking for a host, and I auditioned to host it, and. Uh, and Whoopi Goldberg was in charge in those days. So I think she had something to do with the deal, and she—I don't know—she didn't see me as the. And I think Tom Bergeron got it. You know, so, right. you, know you never know. I mean, I—you know—I I keep throwing. You know, I keep throwing my career. Uh, you know, just I go in whatever direction. You know, I don't really have a game plan. I just kind of I go in with where you know what what opportunities come along, and I've and I've enjoyed the ride. I've had some great experiences. I've been all over the world doing stuff, yeah, fun yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's the, that's the one thing I can say. I, I've been able to be lucky enough to be in the room with some of the greats. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet some. And you're right about the people in Hollywood. The people that I always got great uh, attention from or t- were able to talk to were people like Ted Knight, who took time to talk to me about how he started in a 50,000-watt radio station, and you know, which is where I began at WIOD down in Miami many, many years ago when I interned for Larry King. You know, so oh my God, you started there. You know, they're still there. I was supposed to host a show next week for WIOD. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not going. I'm not going to do it now. I, I've changed my mind. Well, it's a very conservative radio station now, from what I understand. I mean, it it's... doesn't. Fit, it doesn't fit with what I do. I mean, you know, it's 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 yeah. It's, they got Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and stuff. And and, and I know you ain't because I want to make it funny and make it light and all this stuff. And she wants to, you know, do, do news events and you know, that's not my that's I... not my strength. That's not my specialty. No, I and you're not. So you're maybe not, you, ought, you ought to call her. They're looking. They'll be looking for a host next week because I'm a bail it out. <laughs> well, I'm. I'm. I. You know, I do politics as well as anybody else. But my whole thing is, 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 is the is, is the Charlie Rose kind of a thing with the mixture of the Larry King stuff. But some of the best people I ever met in Hollywood were were the people that had already been there. You know, and the one thing that I do miss about Hollywood is pinks. Oh, pinks! The hot dogs are pinks. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you talk about Larry King. Larry King, I think, was one of the best interviewers. Yes. And in, 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 he was so good. I mean, I remember when he was here at Wolfie's and doing shows down in Miami. Right. But I did Larry King as a guest. And, and, you know, Larry was a guy that never prepared. He just liked to, you know, see where the questions, you know, he you know he, he read a little by. I mean, everybody says they don't prepare. But, but right. uh, you know, I just thought Larry had such a skill for that. It's, and Charlie Rose does as well. And some of the young guys that are on today, you know, I never thought Jay was a great interviewer. You know, Jay was a great comedian, a great joke teller. I don't mm-hmm. think Fallon's a great interviewer. I think Fallon's a great mimic. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I, Colbert's a, a Colbert, I think Colbert's a good interviewer, and I, Colbert's interested. And, and, I, and I, I, But I go back to that. I love to have, I love to watch mm-hmm. conversation. I love to see, you know, things you know, most people come on to promote the, whatever their vehicle, whatever their project is, you know, and, right. and, it, and it, it, it's so, so seldom that people get the time to really share and open up. And you, you yeah. I want to feel like after I've watched an interview with somebody that I, I, I've learned something new about them. That's why I like to do the format that I do. It's long form, not short form. I have one more question that I got to say good night. Uh, someone this asked. The fastest five minute interview I've ever done. Yes. Uh, where can they see Pilots of the Caribbean? That's on your website, which is. Shrinermedia.com. Yeah, it's on. It's on there. If somebody out there has got you know one hundred million dollars and wants to make it, I'm ready to go. Uh, 
Yeah, everything's up on my website. I mean, I do, I, I do emceeing, I do auctions, I do all, you know, I mean, I, right. I'm a jack of all trades and I, you know, I, I love doing it, you know, and I, you know, I, I can pick and choose now cause I'm, you know, my kids are out of college and my daughter works on Mike and Molly and my son, if he gets his show picked up, they're set, you know, so, uh, yeah. And I'll just be living, you know, on a on a private island somewhere, you know. And, uh, and you can you know, finally save the money for yourself instead of paying off college uh, loans. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Hey, listen, Will, it's been a quick hour. I want to thank you so much, my dear friend. I'm going to call you in about, oh, five minutes or so, uh, and we'll talk. But I thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us here on The Express. God bless you, and thank you again. All right, Gary. Well, thanks for having me on. Good luck with that. I hope you find that talk show vehicle that you want or that, you know, that, that – lead role in the uh you know in, in the movie you're looking for it's you know it's just around the corner for all of us so uh, don't give up and keep plugging away i will and i want to thank everybody out there for joining us tonight that was will schreiner actor comedian producer director and one of the greatest guys that i've ever known in my life he's a dear dear friend don't forget to join me on facebook at gary allen twitter at capital g small a d express and of course meet gary allen.com on know me thank you all very much for taking a few minutes out of your day to join us here on the express And again, thank you to everybody. And until next week, please take care of yourselves and each other. You've been listening to The Express with Gary Allen. Join us here every Tuesday night at 10 for more captivating talk with Gary Allen. See you next time on The Express.